Hello, it's David Herman, and this is part two of the clover and the cicada. So, um, if you go to my YouTube channel, on a quest 1618, O N A Q U E S T 1618, you can find part one. All right. So let me turn on some music. I'm going back to bensound.com. I tried to use Epic Sound. And when the videos uh, first posted, YouTube says no copyright infringements. Now that they've been up a while, every song in it says copyright infringement. And uh, even though my channel doesn't generate a dime, uh, they like to point out to you that you're being uh, singled out to know that they're all copyright infringed. So I do not recommend EpidemicSound.com unless you want to pay them. It says royalty free, but they're not. When you actually put them in videos, then they try and make money off you. So uh, I'm going to Ben Sound, which never gives me a problem. And that's just me. And anyone else that wants to tell me where they get great music for their videos, just leave it in the comments because I don't want to pay for the music. I don't charge for these videos, and uh, I don't make any money. So, anyway, back to the art. Uh, let's start out with what's called extreme action. Uh, let me go back here, see if I can do that. Uh, I think if I hit play, there we go. So this is royalty fuse, mu free music by Ben Sound, and I go to um, I pick out a particular genre, the longest royalty free music sounds, and then I I play those, and I just click on them one at a time. So it doesn't cycle by itself, but there you go. All right, so now let's move in on this cicada and work on the body. For those of you who don't know, this is Affinity Designer. You should be able to tell from the interface. And it, the date and time and everything's in the lower right-hand corner. 3.30 in the afternoon, roughly on 5.30-2021. All right. Let's get down in Cicada. We'll start with the head. I'm going to select the brush. And uh, I've been trying to keep this uh, painterly, so it looks like, even though it's digital, that it's... Uh, dry brush and wet brush on um, a canvas with an airbrush background. So let's see if we can continue to have our digital artwork look like um, hand painting in the analog world. I'm going to go to dry media. I'm going to select the brush I haven't used. This will be chalk-like. I like texture, so we get a little texture. And let's just try this brush. I haven't used it before. And so, first thing I'm going to do is pick out a, a, a blue with some red, not quite a purple, and a deep shade of it. So if you see, I'm moving the up and down the left-hand side of the triangle for these tones. First, we're going to do some dark. Well, actually, we're going to do some light shade, now that I think about it, the way I'm going to work. Uh, and I've got to figure out where I'm going to navigate that light shade from. Let's try some of this. Now let's just work around the eyes to start. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to change the diameter of the brush. And I'm going to start like a... I don't know all the insect names for these things. So, um, but in the socket, I'm in the socket. And uh, I'm doing a little bit of a black because it just switched, which is fine. I will, I will make use of that just because it happened. And I will do a little line work sort of to define uh, these shapes. So each eye is, it's not really in a socket, it's in kind of like a, 
a bulgy area, and these would all have names, you know, in the insect world, but uh, there's some things I know in insect worlds and a lot of things I don't know. So let's just get some line work for this going to define the space of um, these things. And there's very interesting shapes. You can, you can imagine almost a heart shape between the eyes on the behind the eye sockets. And um, the things fit together like locking keys. You know, they look like the ancient building blocks where there's no mortar used. I notice this on all insects and serpents and things like that, that the ancient people of the earth were so in tune with nature that they actually mimicked it in the way they built. And because they thought like that, and not really like we think, the civilizations that are the most old, uh, it leads me to believe that if we ever met these guys, and there is a civilization that was alive on the earth before us, but way different than us, that um, they would be very akin to the insect world. Uh, I don't know if in appearance, but they would certainly not be like us. They think different, they look different, and their agendas are different. And uh, that's a fact. That is really a fact. So uh, just like we find sand everywhere, and I'm just throwing this in here so that we're like sitting in my studio talking. I go all over the place if you listen to the video. Sometimes it's political, sometimes it's about construction, sometimes it's about art. It can be anything because this is the way I would talk to my friends. Originally, I'm from Michigan, so the Midwest. Now I live in Olympia, Washington, in case you want to hunt me down. And uh, when someone visits you in the studio, you're just talking about everything. They're not necessarily coming to discuss the art. They're your friend. They're coming to visit with you. So they're just, you know, coming over to have a burger, bring you some food, or drink your wine, or share some time and all that good stuff, you know? Which I miss a lot. Because when I was younger, and I was a single dad, uh, a lot of those visitors were my female companions. <laughs> I was a lucky man, to say the least, as a single dad. Because I didn't have an agenda. And because everyone was growing up and experiencing the world together. We didn't have any of this garbage computer stuff to distract us. We spoke to each other instead of through text, which changes as soon as you send your text. Your message changes, the wrong message gets there, you spend half a day explaining to the person what you meant, the other person's all hypersensitive and blah, blah, blah. It was reality. This is a not reality, what you experience today, in my opinion. And when you're actually in the real world, just sitting in your studio, and this is just me, so don't get bent out of shape. It's just part of being an artist. Anyone that visits me is welcome to come by. Uh, when you're in town, you're from another part of the world, you found me on ArtStation, please send me an email when you're in Olympia, Washington. Identify yourself, show me where you are in ArtStation so I can find you and that you're not a poser. And uh, you'll be welcome to visit me uh, and have art discussions and sit outside. And uh, I'll take you around Olympia a little bit if you're interested. And we can collaboratively make a meal or sit out and look at the stars at night, which there aren't too many of, but <laughs> they're out here. Um, So now, it's still playing, I'm not sure if it, there it goes, it just ran out. So now it's time for me, I don't think it will start another one, see, we'll listen. 
but I don't think it's going to do that. You see how I'm shaping this? And I'm expanding out a little bit from the body. Uh, the wings kind of plug into these sides, and they've got all kinds of mechanisms. I mean, if anyone thinks they're a genius in robots, just look at an insect. It's so far ahead of you that it's ridiculous. It's just too far ahead. And this whole wing needs to move over. Wow. Well, we'll just see if we can fake it. Let's see. This bump is here. This comes off this way. I'm going to relocate something. I'm going to just change this over this way. There we go. But if you study uh, the mechanisms of these insects, just a tiny thing like a cicada has so many parts, it's mind-blowing, and all those parts are aerodynamic and 50 times as um, amazing as anything you're going to make out of aluminum or some little parts that you make in your, in your shops, you know, to, to emulate insects. do a save and let's hit the next tune by the way I'm cooking up my chicken drumsticks and vegetables in the uh, in the oven so I got five six chicken drumsticks going and two different peppers a yellow and an orange cleaned and broken up and uh, garlics olives a red sauce you know red tomato sauce with the spices and stuff you use on uh, spaghetti. Uh, a raw onion chopped up, a nice sweet uh, onion. And uh, that's all cooking for about an hour. And then what I do is when I get done with that, I, uh, I uh, take the lid off my Dutch oven, which is inside the oven with all that in it, so it cooks inside, just bakes it all. And I take the lid off and I put the broiler on it, and then I broil all the tops like it was in a grill. And I'll tell you, you can make some food in the house that tastes just like you barbecued it, and it's really good. And then I'll eat that for two, three days, like three days. A couple drumsticks chunks of vegetables and stuff in the bowl with the red sauce and uh, good stuff good stuff I'm figuring out what to do so I'm going up a layer we'll work this eye a little bit and then I'm going to um, not quite sure exactly how I'm going to go about this but you're watching me do it there's a tilt to things and a brightness to things and I kind of had a a nice glow I may even actually you know bot it up a little bit to sci-fi it again this music is just playing uh, off of bensound.com we'll give him a shout out because for some reason <laughs> this music's okay on YouTube and the other one isn't so they're all sneaky they're sneaky all these companies man I never can win and I'm just an artist trying to share artwork and make it interesting but they got all figure out how to monetize everything I just no good at monetizing wish I was so I could earn a living doing that. But, and anybody that contacts me and says they know how to do it, they want money, they don't say they, they really can do it. If they really could do it, they would just do it and, and take a percentage. But they just want to make money because their results are not predictable. And uh, yeah, I can do that myself. I am one or two secrets away from making it. The minute I figure it out, on my own apparently, I will be set like anyone else. 
but it's not going to be with uh, the computer age, I don't feel. I feel I have another discovery yet to make in the real world. I've made a lot of discoveries. None of them, a lot of them can't be shared with the masses, but I've been on a path my whole life. And uh, been blessed with a lot of things, but beat up, the things that beat me up always took the wealth and the uh, good stuff away because as soon as people figure out it's in your bank account, they hunt it. <laughs> and that goes for the banks. It goes for everybody. They're just predatory. I find it really disgusting. <laughs> Even in my old age, I'm, <laughs> I'm still a rebel. I still believe that the good in man is yet to come out. It's going to take a major event, and it's going to take complete wiping out of the Earth's government and structure and everything. It's just going to be a humongous event by the Alpha from somewhere else, the apex predator, whether they're on the Earth or not. They will make themselves known to some generation, and when they do, all bets are off. They're not playing, especially if they're already on the Earth. If they were never even came from space, but like us, they tried to go out in space and left things that we're interpreting the wrong way, which I kind of think we are. They're older when we find residue and stuff in places, but uh, they just did stuff to do it because they could, just like we can, only they were far superior than us at such things. And so that's why it's out there. It's not because they're from there. I mean, when you're talking about Mars, let's say, and this is just studio talk, Mars is a tiny little place. Very tiny. You have to understand that. It's, it's like small. It's like the size of our moon. <laughs> we would do wet, much better if we would go to the moon and build a colony than go to Mars and build a colony. Mars is nothing. There's nothing to be gained there. But people that want to go there, people that are convincing us to do it, are just trying to raise funds and steal money from anywhere they can find it. You know, my opinion, you follow Elon Musk, he's always following the money. Look at the companies he started and sold, and uh, look at his business practices. I don't find them very ethical. Study how batteries are made, and you'll see what I mean. Find out where cobalt comes from. <laughs> Just studio talk. But, you know, if you want to be a person on a leading edge, that's what you got to do. You got to investigate the world for yourself. You can watch it go by on YouTube and say you're into this and you're into that. But I would say go out, study. You can just study free, quite a bit from your house. And I've studied an immense amount of things and made an immense amount of contacts. Because I use YouTube differently. I'm from a different generation. So I actually hunt down guys and gals and try and communicate with them. The women scientists don't communicate with you at all, but the men will. And uh, so uh, the ones that have funding for things, you know, that they're working on that never produce, produce any results, but have figured out how to get into the loop of the PhD, uh, you know, live off, what do you call it? government funds if you um, promote their agenda those guys have been around forever they're now in their 80s and 90s and they haven't grown one inch if you watch them talk on tv now whether they know things that they're not talking about that's another 
thing entirely. You're watching me go from, uh, uh, in case you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm going from layer to layer to find out where I can erase uh, stuff I don't want on the screen there around the border of my insect because it expands out too much. And you got to start at the top and work your way down or start at the bottom and work your way up. So we're going to go up again. And we're trying to get rid of this stuff on the side of the head. But not take away the background. It may be, see like if I put the arrow around, you can see it's it wants to take away the background there. So we're going up layer by layer. And if I can't find this, then, then it's on the background and I can't, I can take it out, but I have to paint in the background over it or something like that. See, like, we've got the music off while we're chatting for a minute. And uh, there we go, I think, no, not quite. So this is very, very confusing. I'll probably have to go down to the actual, I must have drawn this right on the background. We will find out shortly. So I've gone up and down twice, I think. And, ah, there it is, see? So edit undo. And it was actually the top layer? I don't know. Yeah, there we go. So we're just taking this down a little bit. Now you notice when I took that down, some lines stay in there. So if I go down a layer, I'm going to, this is below the bottom eye, in case you don't know where I'm at, I'm erasing the body and some line work. And um, because I Oh, okay, so each of those are the leaves to the clover, I forget. So somewhere in the very early beginning, okay, edit, undo, edit, undo. Let's try that. There it is. See that? The insect, I forget, was separate than all those petals. I put that on a different layer. Very wise of me to do that. And so see this is erasing the background but not that image. So you undo that. This is what makes uh, this interesting is because it's called being non-destructive. So when you're non-destructive you can edit your work without ruining your work. And sometimes I'm just persistent. I have to find out what, where it is. Where is that bugger? So another way to do it, since I've been unsuccessful, is go to your arrow key and touch outside the area, like on the flower, for instance. Then go back and hit that stroke. It's lighting up the top area, the very top layer. Now, if I go there, there it is. It's come out. And so if I want to replace that, I could or I could draw over it. And in this instance, I will be drawing over it because there is um, some front leg, like you just see part of in this area. And uh, I will do this. I will go up. I will make one more layer. I will grab a kind of an orange to start. I will go to the brush and I will paint that leg right here, which is just about as wide as an eye, almost, not quite. But the first digit that you see part of from the top view is pretty close. So this is would be on the underside. Um, you know, it comes out underneath. can have it like that and there's going to be one on the top side so we'll put one up there like 
so. And of course I'm going to color that, you know, I'm going to shade it and it was like a highlight there, so get that coming down to here. As long as they're on separate layers, you can erase and edit and do that. So see, we're on a separate layer. Watch, I'm going to take it away, some of it, from the background. Just tidy it up. Makes it, I'm working at the top. You see that? I'm going to edit, undo, like that. And it can go back. Watch. So erasing is very powerful. I, I, I totally want you to be aware of that. That you can, as long as you're on a separate layer, so you could shorten the length, you could narrow the sides, um, whatever you want. Same thing at the bottom one, if I want to just tidy that up a little bit. And it has structure, they have structure, so uh, there could be highlight on there. Um, you know, go back to brush, you have a little highlight on the edge of that joint at the top like that and you can start to show the actual leg underneath going down just suggest it uh, like that you know so there you go and you can see part of it and it could be fuzzier or brighter or whatever you want to do with it. Um, you know, you could put it in the sunlight, just like so. It's it's going cascading down. You would see some light on the upper edge, like that, of the next one. You'd have to have some some kind of a dark, just a fuzz into it like that to show some of the structure. Maybe a popcorn highlight on that edge. Just get this down. Like that. Now, uh, a little back shading. So come up here and shadow the back. Get some structure in there. Just enough to suggest. You know, you don't really have to well, if you're me, you have to. You gotta have it look like it works. And some texture in the of the of the, the thing itself without being too busy. So I'm gonna do a save. And I'll view this at 100. And that would be actual size of this sheet is a uh, portrait. No, a landscape of a 9 by 12. So there you go. So that's it. So now if I go back to um, view, say, at 400, you can see that. If I go view at 200, you can see a good area to work in where you can actually define stuff in large so that when it's scaled down, it's suggesting... Uh, architecture, uh, you know, or structure to the uh, limbs, and uh, always cool stuff, you know what I mean? Always cool stuff. There you go. So I do file save. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pause one minute so I can check the phone and check my meal. Hang on. World. Uh, okay, so I'm back. Uh, food's baking. It's got another half hour before I take the lid off. And uh, that's just like, you know, it's back at temperature, I think. Hang on one second again. Ah, I'm back. Boy, did I get Shanghai for a while. <laughs> Anyways. Here we go, back on the cicada. We're working the eyes. The eyes have these little uh, partitions and stuff in them. They're very strange. So I'm gonna work the top eye a little bit now. Uh, I had quite a few things to address today, so. 
unable to rush back. There we go. Uh, let's the top eye. Put a little border back there. So I'm gonna be in brush. Top layer. I'm gonna go to the next layer. Yeah, I can stand that way. All right. Let's get the brush size just right. Try and put some shadow in there behind the top. We're gonna go up one layer. Works better. Yeah, very subtle. Um, that's because our flow could be more. And now it should put down a, a, a little stronger weight of a line. There we go. Now, it's also subdivided. It's just like that. Yeah, that's good enough. They, they do have these partitions and stuff that go over them per perpendicular to each other. So uh, if I open it up a little, they're very strange. They have like a band in them. Um, so like, it goes this way too. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to change my brush to pencils. Actually, I'm going to change to basic. And then I'm going to pick like a pencil type of an airbrush kind of a... When I say airbrush, it's just, it, it doesn't have a texture, it, it's just smooth. But you can see that line there, see? It's kind of a partition. They raise and they close by themselves and they do things. The insect world is so just remarkable. And if you really get down and do a, a detail, you could go forever just in an eye. I mean, there's so much stuff going on in the head of an insect or the body or anything. It's just infinite parts. They're so amazing. They really are. They're just so amazing. <clears throat> you could have it do anything, and it would be <laughs> working within the parameters of the insect. And we'll put a little hardness in there. It needs a little bit of that. These programs, they do their thing, you know, their own stuff. There we go. So strange. Okay, we've got the stroke, we've got the brush. 100% flow, blah, blah. Should be leaving a mark. Now, why I don't see a mark, that's a question. Strange. So I'm going to go up a layer. really not showing a mark all the way around interesting but par partially hmm. something bizarre going on we are above all the layers let's just go down here for a second and see something showing on that layer better no idea why that's what I mean about these softwares. They're very... <coughs> there's things in them that even the makers of the software don't know what they do. But they'll do them. They'll do weird stuff. And they shouldn't. That's way too strong. So, edit and do, edit and do, take the hardness off, and try again there, like that, yeah. And the music's pretty good, I don't know if you can hear it or not, we'll see, but it's that uh, royalty-free stuff. 
on a station called Ben Sound, so I'm giving out a shout to you, Ben Sound. Don't make it difficult for me to post. All right, we got the head there. I'm gonna take this outside border off, I think. So let me uh, take that back. I'm gonna go one layer at a time until I can get rid of it. You know what? It turns out it looks like it's just a, it's not actually the head. It's of some reflections in my reference. See, we get part of it. This is what the layers are for. Okay, now we're into the plant, so it can't be on that. So we're going to go down here. It's not that layer. And... See, that takes the background out. And I don't really want to do that. So. These type of things are things you're going to run up against. So. While I try and solve these. It does serve a purpose. It means that when I was drawing uh, a petal. One of those layers. I saw something and jumped across. Forgot about it and did something on the head. And so it's on the same layer as a petal of the clover, a flower of the clover. And we're gonna make sure we get that, hopefully. This is where systems break down. It's all human error. You forget when you did something. Hmm. So there's something in here now. I'm going to open that up, open that up, slide it over. Oh. It just nested itself. There we go. See, it was a top layer after all. How about that? But see, this way I have the background still. And that's what I want to show you, that you can do these things. Uh, and then if you set your layers up right, you have other options. So you, you can rework without destroying your art. And sometimes it'll even make uh, interesting art with the air. So, but now I've got a nice eye over there. I just want to get that little bit of yellow out of there. Uh, actually, it's like a front leg that's flying up in the illustration. So I could, I could go back to the top, put a new layer. It doesn't matter how many layers you have, and just kind of paint in a fuzzy foot out there, like this leg is bent and then this is fuzzing out, so uh, we'll take this down to like 60-ish, take this down, and uh, yeah, so there we go, right around the corner of the eye, you can see fuzzed out, and then there might be like the leg is out somewhere here in space, and just kind of just uh, well push it back where it's lower away from the eye underneath the eye you know and then you'd see it sort of in the light and it might even be fuzzier 
it might even be larger you know you can do some weird like it has structure but you can't tell what it is like that you know and there's some could be some hairs here and there or whatever's on the uh, these legs and of course you don't have to do all this kind of minutia I'm a detailed freak, and I do it because uh, when you really get down at the end, it's pretty slick. You know, it just makes it work, makes it beautiful. And some more light right there. Real, just a little pop up here. Like that. You know, insects are weird. You don't have to have it all make sense, like your mind will make it sense of it when it's small. And then this is like a uh, turtleneck <laughs> sweater or something behind the head. It gets, um, it's very strange, very strange. So we'll work with that too. And that's a dark band. Runs across the top, but it's like a, a rolled up tube. So we're going to create that look in a minute. Just as it transitions and comes across here and goes down here. And there's different shades of light and white and stuff like that and you know it gets captured so you can add some of that to raise it up surface wise and um, you know I guess people can work way faster than me of course where they edit it but real time is what you're going to be doing when you work and so it doesn't hurt to see that other artists have the same issues you have and that we're really not like on a bullet train. These things take time. And there's shortcuts around them. You can, you know, start with a real reference or uh, and just airbrush it and stuff. But for myself to practice painting in my portfolio and stuff, you know, um, I do these things from scratch. You know, they're just, they gotta take time. I mean, imagine family portrait or something. If they're doing the head of the family, like if you're doing a presidential portrait, the guy might work on that thing for 30 hours, 40 hours, 50 hours. You know, it's live sittings and uh, just good art takes time. I don't care who you are. There's people that learn to work fast because they do it every day super fast you know like any profession i was doing every day of the week i got better at and better and better and better and better and better but when you're uh working on your own to have the discipline to do it every day and drop what you're doing and stuff it's, it's not there it's just not there you work hard and there's there's things that you see the more you look with your eyes, these magnifications of stuff, but um, there is so much that you, until you look at a photograph, super detailed photograph, like I work with some really detailed photographs as a reference, you can't even imagine all the little minutia, tiny things that are in the head of an insect. They're like so complicated the sensory mechanisms and things that uh, you know you take our best bot it's got you know take a car a car has 15,000 parts an insect probably has you know a hundred thousand and think of how tiny it is compared to a car and yet it flies <laughs> It can fly upside down. It has magnetometers in its head. It's got gyroscopes. It's got the uh, torus-type 
mechanisms that uh, can um, GPS it to magnetic north, you know. It's it just, we think we make great things and we slap ourselves on the back all the time and say, oh yeah, we're geniuses. But you try and make an insect, forget it. You know? They are flying robots. <laughs> They're autonomous systems that were made by creation wanting to do the act of being an insect, whatever that is. It had a purpose. You know? The insect does something very important, each one. And that's probably many, many things besides just pollinating a plant or... Um, and you notice I took a little bit off the foot and that's good, that's the way it should look. Um, besides pollinating a plant, besides uh, eating a certain type of insect that it removes when there's an overpopulation of them, besides uh, having something in it that might be a cure to a disease. I mean, everything is linked to everything else. That's the point. Like, why is something a cure to a disease to us? Because we are linked. We are all linked cosmically in the way that the particle in the wave is linked. And the name for that, you know, there's a name for all that stuff. So, you can study things till you turn blue in the face, as they say. There's plenty to study. So, Pick some. If it's art, it'll be till the rest of your life, till you die, till you ever really get good at it. And that's the thing. You can do something your whole life. Art. You know, I don't know if anyone will. I've sold paintings at different times in my life because I lived in cities where people could afford them or people collected them or people related to my art. And all that was good. When you move to somewhere where they don't, or it's going to take time to get to know you all over again, and uh, you're out of the, the hood where people collected you, and now it's up to, you know, adding charges to mail and things like that, uh, you kind of lose your clientele. Unless they're very wealthy. But usually with my art, because each one's unique, and the style is there. I have my own unique way of drawing. Everything's so different that even if someone found one they love, they absolutely have to have it. And many people did and paid good prices. Um, they may never buy another painting because that's what they found that they enjoyed from me was that one piece. And I relate to that. You know, why have your house full of one guy's artwork? That makes no sense. So, uh, unless you're kichi, you know, unless you got some kind of a, you know, thing that that becomes popular just because it's, you know, whatever it is that makes it popular. Many things make art popular, but if somebody likes, you know, pussy cats with ears on them. I mean, a, a girl with a hoodie that has a pussy cat ear on it, or something like that. Uh, you know, contemporary art or emo art or art with no purpose. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, the people that relate to it relate to it. But you know, to collect more than one piece of somebody, would you'd have to have really like the millionaire that. Um, knows it's an investment and uh, they, no matter how ugly it is or whatever it is, they're just going to buy it, you know. So, point I'm making is art's a very strange business to try and make a living in and without kind of a fake start with, uh, you know, a conglomerate of people 
pushing you forward or making you famous by uh, buying your work and building the number up or it's so complicated stories of artists when you see them <laughs> they're more like people's pets you know the ones that really get famous somebody else took them and wanted to make love to them or wanted to uh, just you know walk around with that person on the end of their arm or uh, it's it's not always about the art, the art world. You know, when you take someone like Andy Warhol, for instance, and don't go getting angry at me, but Andy Warhol glommed on to some very wealthy debutantes and lived off their fortunes. And, uh, Eventually, just by socializing with the people, the time he was in, the scarcity of artists and so on, the wealthy people that had bought his art and wanted to make sure it would work, um, those people made Andy Warhol who he is. And it wasn't always just about Andy Warhol. And then Andy Warhol got very, very, very eccentric, had crazy lovers, made crazy movies about all that. And people started paying attention because there was only like one Andy Warhol. You know, nobody was like copying, trying to be Andy Warhol. The guy that actually collected his, uh, you know, Andy Warhol could not sell in the beginning any of those soup can paintings. None of them. None of them. So the guy who gave him an opening and tried to promote him bought the entire collection from Andy Warhol. He negotiated a price of something like $3,500. But he was an art dealer, okay? And so he knew how to make Andy Warhol collectible. So now he owned all of those, put Andy on like a stipend. And I forget, last count, what those things went for. Uh, or were worth, you know, individually they're worth like say 30 million or something. But he bought the whole collection for 3,500 bucks in a year when 3,500 bucks was a lot of money. You know, say like 1960 or something, I don't know. Just guessing the year because I can't remember all the artists' uh, timelines. And again, we're just talking in the studio. I'm drawing. And talking to you to have a little bit of fun going on while we're watching me draw. I amble along, for sure I do it. And these could be very, you know, replicate everything that you see, or you just kind of get the feel of it, of the, of the thing. The antenna, you know, the, the thing. Mm -hmm. Save. And uh, it's starting to look like a uh, machine head, you know, I'm kind of. Needs to be much darker in places, which we're about to do. And a lot of times, if it's not getting darker or something, you just go up a level. I don't know why these, the software does that, but it does. And so. Each software, whether you're in, work, in um, you know, Photoshop or Paint or um, Affinity Designer or uh, any of the infinite other programs, they all have quirks. They all have little things that you got to figure out that, uh, you know, the companies themselves are always seeking to improve on, but priorities being what they are depends what they get to.
if they ever get to it. Because if the problem is really a deep problem, a really complex problem that's creating it, something that's buried in the beginning of the program or hard to find or something like that, then they may never get to it. They may never get to it. It may be an addition seven billion and eighty six, you know. And as they as they work on it, it's sort of like a person that keeps, you know, adding layers and layers and layers to a drawing. But the stroke is hidden somewhere. Now with art, there's clever ways to find them. But with software, not so much because the tree, like the main programs, such as in Windows or in uh, the tree of Apple's software and all that, they get built on over and over and over and over and a person changes and someone gets fired and someone gets hired and someone gets gone or moves or dies or whatever and there's a secret somewhere that they got to keep finding and looking for and how do we fix this and what year was it that it started and when did we add this to the software and you know there may not even be records of all those things there's not i'm sure the records would be as you know a whole nother kind of like thing to take and track and everything that you track just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So let's say that. Let's view this at actual size, or to fit. So there's the head. Now the head's starting to look like an insect, right? That's at 91%. If I go view uh, 100%, there it is. 9 by 12 in portrait mode. And that's a good start so far. And then if I go to... Uh, 200 to work on it. There's that. And that's how it works. So I'm just going to continue to work. Let's see where we're at, how much time. So there's a... Let's see. We're about 57 minutes into it. I will do a little longer. Hmm. Yeah. Let me get the music back on and stop yakking. My bad. Okay, this one's called Love, this track on uh, Ben Sound. And I've never had any problem with Ben Sound on uh, YouTube. But the other one, they keep, they backtrack. It's like after I post, where it says no infringement, then all of a sudden somebody is claiming an infringement with the other station. And they don't want to boost, knock your video off the, all your hard work down the toilet. What they tell you is that you wouldn't get any money. And then they also tell you, well, you're not even a monetizing guy, so I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. But I like to have all my ducks in a row in case something changes. Or in case somebody, uh, just likes my art enough to volunteer building me a proper YouTube channel in exchange for profits. I can't pay anything up front, but if you like my art, if you want to help me in the world, uh, and you know how to make a YouTube monetized channel that makes money, because I've been on there probably 12 years, I don't make a dime. You know, I got 500 videos and stuff. It doesn't make any money. And when uh, COVID happened, oh my gosh, everything just went crazy backwards. All of us got Shanghai. So. Uh, anyone that's a volunteer that wants to make money off me, I'll gladly work with. But you gotta contact me and, and prove to me you got some money making channels and stuff and that you'll do it. Because I can't just risk it, but I'll risk it if you can uh, have like a 
Skype chat, show me who you are, that kind of stuff. So now that we kind of played with the head for a while, we've kind of got an idea of how to build this quicker. Let's see. Insect armor. Uh, I forget what it's called. And there's also something in the armor. Um, so these channels that you see in the, it's like a water channel on there. You can tell that the civilizations that built the Mayan, the Incan, the Olmec, the Toltecs, they were more insect-like in their thinking. And it's scary to me because I hope they don't look like insects. But there was a, there's a species, whether they're on the earth or not, that thinks and sees in the infrared and the ultraviolet, not so much our light spectrum, because their art, their structures, their everything is really, you got to delve so deep to find what they were doing that on a different spectrum, spectrum it shows up better, you know. Just like us looking at their cities, you know, we say, oh, there must have been 20,000 people living here. And then you go with LIDAR and you go below the ground and you look, and then you go, holy cow, there's a metropolis of 600 buildings and they had 4 million people living in the space. Where's the cadavers? Where's the dead people? Where is it? And then you realize, well, maybe they're older than we think they are, these civilizations. Maybe they're 12,000 years old, not 4,000 years old, and they're all washed away into the sea and stuff. Because when you study facts, when you study real archaeology, geology, science, it's, it's way complicated. And it's not easily discernible. It's not. It's just not. Um, you know, an example is sand. You see sand all around the pyramids, all around Egypt, everything like that. One day I decided to figure out where sand comes from because there's no way there were giant mountains that all of a sudden just got pulverized down into minute dust. That's not how sand could be made. So I looked it up and I started studying it. And sand is there's this giant 500 pound fish called a parrotfish that's like a great big flat bluegill kind of looking fish. And that fish eats coral and poops sand. So for all that sand to be in the desert, I kid you not, it had to be on the bottom of the ocean. And there's no water there. So it was once below water. And this is where the people that came out of the water come from, you know. This is where we're, we're not quite understanding it because it's just doesn't fit our paradigm but it's the truth you know where did the sand come from well it was at the bottom of the ocean the coral in that area it was eaten by a fish that pooped it and made that for eons so the sand there is literally you know 50,000 years old let them date the sand. You know, that's the problem. The more you understand about science, the crazier science is. And the facts are real. And they're hard to even get a grasp on as a human being. You just, you just go, that's not possible. How, how, on, how did that happen? And then you realize, well, yeah, there was a catastrophic flood. There was floods everywhere, uh, whatever caused them. You know, meteorites, poles shifting, um, uh, volcanic plates shifting, the, the tectonic plate shifting, volcanoes doing something. The Earth is this 
living organisms. So it'd be like, you know, when you think, a lot of stuff's happening in your head. Same thing with the earth. When it, you know, does stuff, it starts somewhere else and it just keeps on going. It's complicated. Now we put a little more detail in here and there, just so that when this is reduced, it looks better. Now, a lot of this detail is missing. Uh, I have, like, more detail I've put in than the actual reference. Just a little bit more, because I can lighten it, and I can look at it, and I can see the detail, and I can make the detail happen. Um, you know, as an artist, I can draw it in, like I'm doing here. And... Uh, it gets more and more complex. And the subtle tonal values you can pop in some places because there's a name for what the skin of an insect does with light. And it escapes me now. It starts with an L, but it like traps and reflects the light in the skin. It's a particular thing that uh, insects do, no other creature. Um, I'd have to look it up, which I'm not going to do in the middle of this art. But uh, So it's a luminosity factor, and any of the bugs that have shiny skins, they do these things. Um, it's a very, 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 very deep and suspiciously cool if you study. You know, you can study. Study stuff. Man, I love studying stuff. I will tell you that. Since I have like a little texture there, you can see that in the eye, and texture in the other eye. I'm going to put some texture throughout with a different brush. I'm going to um, go back to the gouache. Third brush down. Gouache on canvas. Put some highlights in there with the texture over the solid stuff. I'll go up one layer and uh, and hit it. So uh, here we go. We'll see if this works. See, so I'm gonna see that, and I can go up one more layer. And see, when I make a stroke, it's not a solid. You're seeing like a canvas, kind of a mark see that and then that that to me is cool it makes it um, painterly like a uh, illustration not so much a photograph keeping the realism trying to keep hyper realism but uh, you know adding the the quality that it's a painting That's another thing altogether. It's trying to convey by pressure. And it looks like I'm erasing, but I'm not. I'm putting gray, a gray texture in there. And, you know, I could pop it more with uh, whites. So do some of this stuff. Maybe connect this together here. Raise this up a little on the nose, kind of there and then hit it with some white textured along the front and just just a little like that see the light just hitting there like that and then you kind of can get into each part as you move backwards uh, to raise them or link them however you want and then that you don't really have to like be um, afraid of its 100% reality because let me tell you something every bug even though they're in the same family like the family of cicadas each one's going to look different and have its own kind of a personal qualities so uh, as a family of bug they all look alike 
but each blug has its own kind of like distinct markings and stuff like its own personal personality I guess you could call it or tons who mated with who and then they get the look you know of a bug so there's some bug stuff Let's save that and put some more leg underneath this leg here this on the bottom it's a little you know red leg sticking out we're trying to uh, show the layer next uh, going down And these could even be his mouth, like it's feeding or something. But I like how I got the one on the on the other side, and I'll I'll uh, maybe bring one out here in the front of the face, my own. Just yeah, you know, it's tricky. You want something there? Oops, a little too far. So when you go to yeah, it's not too bad. I think I will I will. Add a tone over that, just a second. Connect that. I like the fuzz, like its feet are fuzzed out. And it does look kind of cool, like it has a link to a leg that's unseen. And that works for me. And so I will go to yellow even. And just below the bottom eye, I will put some yellow in there like a light. And then a touch above on the edge of that arm oh I just love insects they're so complex if you're into robots study insects when we see the life forms that made us we're going to be terrified I, I just know it I just know it. They do not look human. There may be another species or two that are human-like. Because it says, you know, in most sacred holy books, which are just, you know, modern tales that are finally put to print. Uh, I mean, you know, ancient tales that were put to print finally, so a lot's lost in the translation. Um... There are things like wheels within wheels, uh, four heads, um, wrestling with an angel. You know, it didn't look, it didn't know it was an angel. It was a human, but so there's a lot of things. I don't know what it all means, but I can tell from looking at their structures. What we know as artists are this: some of the items. One, everything scales. So if you're very small, like uh, Japanese people in a different time, nowadays with good food and everything, they, the people are taller and everything, but back when they were samurai and living in Japan, they were smaller. And so a Japanese house was based on the scale of a tatami mat. They took a tatami mat, they made that a certain size, and then your house would be maybe seven tatami mats laid out in a pattern, you know what I mean? And that would be the scale for, say, two adults and a child or something like that. When you look at the ancient Romans and Greeks and you see these gigantic structures, where the pillars are 50, 60, 70 feet tall, again, that has to speak to scale. Why do you need things that tall? It's too laborious, too complicated to move them, to build them, to shift them into place. Even if they're made out of parts, it's just to raise something in the air to stack them and so on. You're talking about scale. And this is where we should be afraid that the beings that inhabited those places were huge. Or they were moving things that were huge, like a rocket ship, a, uh, you know, an underground tunnel they were building on land or something. And they just needed these giant spaces. They were airports. They could withstand torque, force, and pressure. 
uh, on a block if something was taking off. See, now we're putting a little bit of a halo around this lower arm. The photograph shows that too, that the camera kind of, uh, you know, captures that stuff. And if I add it in there, with the contrast between the, uh, the leg and the body, then, you know, the detail starts to show up if it's just a little bit lighter than the background. Not too much. You know, and if it's, if like where I just did it there, it's too bright. So again, edit, undo, edit, undo, edit, undo. So we get rid of it. Because the top that I just put in around that leg, it's too bright. And what I'll do is I'll go a different tone, a little darker. I'll go over it again. Push it back. There we go. Push it back. Maybe just come around the head. You can just have little subtle things that when you see it at 100%, your mind just puts all this together. And you've got to do artistic tricks or you've got to do things. You know, a photograph does not translate like you think always, you know, you, that it would look like you think you think to yourself. Uh, it would look like such and such. But then when you see it magnified, you go, oh, well, no, it looks like that. Pardon me. So, uh, developing a keen eye to see these things. And I have the music off. Again, it looks like I'm peeling away the picture, but I'm just putting down a bright white with a texture and articulating some of these lumps. This is the minutiae stuff where uh, you know, if you're a detail guy, gal, when I say guy or gal, when I say person, I always mean both, you know, male, female. I'm not playing any games. Don't be angry at me person. It's just too much to think about, you know, all that stuff when you're drawing. <laughs> We're artists. We love each other. We're, you know, no one's saying any kind of derogatory statements. But I will say science uh, tries to hide stuff from us. Not the scientists, but they're told by those that fund science not to make outlandish claims, not to present evidence that's going to fool us. There was a woman who, you know, her entire life was ruined because she found uh, Clovis heads 25,000 years old and did the research, did the proper dating and all of that stuff. I can't think of her name right now. And I think it was in the America, in the, like the United States even. And they just decimated her career. Decimated you know, said she would never get work again. She's, I think she's still alive. If she is, she's rather old. If she, if not, she passed recently. But they just ruined her career. And you do that to a couple people, a couple victims, and then everybody else that wants to be a scientist still has to play the game. Because they don't have the money to do the research, their own digs and all that. Today, you get tenured at a university or something, so you can go out on a dig. It's funded by the university. Maybe you make a great find. Maybe they hide it in a cellar. <laughs> but they'll pay you to work. So if you are if you like doing the work and you're not too morally compromised by having to do that, you can go out, make your personal discoveries before you die, feel good that you found it, but nobody in the world's ever going to know about it. Because if it doesn't fit the paradigm that they're trying to teach you about how the world was formed and blah, 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 which is hogwash. I mean, we knew it was hogwash when I was a kid because my buddies were in archaeology programs, got their masters, got their PhDs. While I was studying art, they were studying, you know, pre-dynastic pottery in Egypt or going to law school or stuff like that. Some of the ambitious ones, I was busy being a single dad raising kids and uh, just 
not very intelligent when I started out. Although I'm glad I did what I did, and I love my family, and we've we've survived all this. Uh, my incompetence, their incompetence, whatever. The ones that were going to these grad schools and stuff would tell me things that uh, was already known. Uh, that had nothing to do with the way they present it to the earth. I mean, to the people. They told me the story, like, okay, here's what they tell us, and this is the truth. You know, they'd say, uh, I don't want to tell you, because I don't want to freak you out. But they would say, you know, yeah, all that stuff is a lie, <laughs> basically. Because they don't want humans to have knowledge. They, don't, they want you to rely on their knowledge. They want you to believe they know what they know. But the truth is the intelligent people that go to school and get their degrees and they're passionate about making discoveries and finding out the real history of man, they snuff all that stuff. They snuff it. And we know it now because... There's so many people who fund it themselves, just go out into the deserts, go out into the jungles, go out and have these podcasts and these, uh, they're backed by wealthy philanthropists and stuff and they find this stuff and they make sure they get it out there before they can ever be uh, attacked. The worst thing that happens is they remove it from YouTube, from Google, from Facebook because they don't own those things. They can get it up. And so you got to watch every day. As a person like me who loves archaeology, loves history, loves the study of man, loves all that stuff, just learning in general, because learning was very important to me as a child. We, we did all our research ourselves in the libraries. Microfish films and Dewey Decimal Systems and a lot of just hand, hand research, spending a whole day in a library to find one periodical, one manual, one something that would give you uh, insight and maybe make your own discoveries. I mean, when I wrote my uh, papers in college, a lot of discoveries I made that uh, weren't put together the way I put them together in research for my uh, class on how to write a thesis paper or something like that, you know, how to do research, make footnotes, all that stuff back then, which I completely forget now. But I do have some of those papers. Usually when I find something old that's 100% right and doesn't go with the today's paradigm, I ditch it. You know why? Because I want people to study and, and find it again. I don't want to make it so that they just, they stumble on it and they go, wow, where did he ever get this idea? That's crazy because even though I footnote it and say, okay, I was studying Scientific American and I went back and I, I found these pictures. And they were real photographs because people couldn't um, digitally make photographs. So a photograph was very much evidence when I was young. Today, not so much. You know, or UFO, it's just everything's fuzzy and stuff. And really they are when your cell phone. It's impossible to take a good picture. And I'm sure they're set up for, uh, if it's an ultraviolet spectrum or if it's infrared, you know, don't do it. There's code, there's software that we don't know about in our phones, in everything, and that's why people can't get that good shot. So, again, I'm just rambling as I draw. Don't take it to heart. But when I tell you my friends that got their, you know, their, what do you call it, their masters and their PhDs did research on stuff that I saw that uh, we knew what was what 
back then. And today they just tell you it's not true. That's all. Because they know. And they know that we know. My generation knows. And the goal is to kill us all. <laughs> Clearly wipe out uh, the baby boomers. So they can lead you astray. It's too much for you to think on yourself. They'll, they'll do the thinking for you. There was, if you ever can look up, uh, there was a great song, a band, that did the song uh, Mr. Blue. And I forget what they're called, like the light, the light something. But if you look up Good Morning Mr. Blue, those lyrics, you'll find the band. And I remember those lyrics right now. It's like, good morning, Mr. Blue. We've had our eyes on you. And the evidence is clear that you've been scheming. So it's kind of like a big brother thing. You want to while away the day. You would even spend time dreaming. What will it take to whip you into shape? A broken heart, a broken head. So back then, even the rock musicians were singing these songs because we lived through this time already. <laughs> this is the past uh, replicating itself again for the generation that's alive now. Because when they run out of things, they repeat. They just repeat, you know? Um, we'll leave it for you to discover. But look up Good Morning Mr. Blue. We've got our eyes on you on YouTube. You'll probably find the song and it's the Light Orchestra or something like that. And when you read the lyrics, you will understand that even back then, back then, we had this stuff. We had this. I don't want to get political. I, I'm doing it again. So I can't help living without being a little bit political because we live in polarized times. But I don't want to ruin anyone's day. I don't want anyone to think if you don't want to think. Yeah, I don't want you to do that. <laughs> All right, let's get into the little more of the body there. This is kind of cool. So now it's a, when they come out of the uh, chrysalis and uh, take the flight, they're really scruffied up with stuck on gunk and funk. And so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put a big shell down, color to the shell. If I want the bottom to be darker than the top, we're going to make ridges perpendicular to this. But I've got to uh, got to shape some stuff here and there. Mm. See, so these rings making bands. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me take that one out. That one do. I didn't want to hide that corner just yet. If I do at all. So I'm going to darken some of this. Okay, now I'm going to go up a notch darker. And I'm going to make some ridges and some dark spaces. And then I'm going to put like funk on it. Like stuff, just pollen and stuff like that. So we're going to come all the way down to here and then it's more of a texture down there. And that's kind of a shape. 
and I think that's good for part two. So let me stop the video, see how far along I am. Yeah, an hour and a half of me dawdling, that's pretty good. Let's stop it. Thanks for watching.